how important is a studio? It's it's everything. It it's the it's the root base of all beginnings. You um, it's there that you have your your certain quality of affections, like paintings that are no good and uh, paintings that are full of promise, paintings that you began uh, um, that morning and you deceivedly, you deceive yourself by thinking you're a genius. I have painted in odd places, but I find the studio builds up a kind of um, uh, energy. And I usually light some incense and kind of do a few things to make it my my space and then yes it's it's kind of charged with energy really after a while yeah in the studio i've got points of references books imagery that i can just quickly lay hold of it it's a wraparound thing that i've come over the last well 15 years since i've 20 years since i've had the studio and it's become quite an important part of my life but i try quite like the idea of the studio as being like a kind of like a theatre, a little stage set for yourself to be an artist in. And I tend to make things in the studio. I make, uh, over the years, off and on, I've made lots of sculptures in the studios, not so that they can become works to, to exhibit, but as part of this whole idea of working in and ornamenting and decorating and playing. It's like a little, I guess I'm very much like a, a just, just crawling child in a playpen in my studio. I like to arrange the things in the studio. So if I change from one studio to another by moving house or whatever, I tend to become traumatised by the change and it takes me quite a long time before I'm happy and playing in this new playpen and ornamenting it and playing with its abacus and so on and so forth. My husband and I moved into this studio that we're in here now less than a year ago because I wanted to live with the pictures and it's been a complete romance to me. All my children have grown up and left home now, so I've got the luxury of being able to smell the oil paint, to wake up in the morning and have a half-finished picture, do an hour if I want to, then go and do all the other jobs I have to do as a woman and a domestic human being. And it's a luxury. I need my studio um, because of its space and its light. Um, when I go out into the bush to get my subjects, they're only the uh, unresolved drawings and notes, that is written notes of descriptions of weather, light, all sorts of things. Then I come back into the studio and formulate the space of the painting, which is to do with the size of the painting, the content of the composition, all of these things. And I need the studio because gradually as I work through my paintings, one painting seems to feed off another. And I need them around me as I work al along for the exhibition. But the studio, I think, for an artist, it's like the kitchen, you know? It's like a place that you want to be. It's like where you want to kind of create something and uh, all of your, your, the your utensils that you have around there I think you love sometimes as much as what you do with them, you know? The studio can be a stimulant in its own right because if I haven't, just say if I haven't painted, if I have a stint where I haven't painted for, uh, for you know, like a couple of months, if I have a bit of a down time, and then I walk back into the studio, just the smell of the studio, will bring on like, oh, I feel like I want to get back in there. So if you open the door and you get that whiff of whatever it is, like terps or, you know, it might sound like a bit of a drug, doesn't it? But, um, but you get that smell. I don't know if you, when you walk into, if you walk into a studio and you, you just sort of feel, you, just, you know, you can sense, this, yeah, it's just the smell. I think it's just the smell, really, that gets you going. The studio I work in does influence uh, the kind of work I do. I find that I had a larger studio earlier and the work was very expansive. This studio um, is kind of very confining and I suppose the subject matter is it, well I've, it's become confining too uh, as well. I, I, most of the paintings are in this little room, I imagine somewhere in the cross or St Kilda or something. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's my dream. That's that's my dream. I always dream about one day I have a big studio and then I could paint lots of paintings inside, and also I can ride bicycle inside as well. <laughs> <laughs> I can look at my painting those sort of things. I'm pretty indulging myself then to among my paintings those sort of things. And uh, yeah, I think in especially in winter too, this studio because it's quite messy. It it it's slightly got a a melancholia that maybe creeps in, and I love. That sort of stuff. I mean, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I like depression quite a lot. Yeah. The studio itself is not enough. Um, what does inspire me to work, which is an external thing, is music. I rarely, in fact, never really paint without music. And I know that some artists need absolute silence, but I need to create um, a situation whereby um, I find the painting rather than impose myself upon it. Somehow or other, it, I need to be in a certain sort of state of, um, of, I wouldn't say lacking total consciousness, um, but there has to be a certain sort of um, uh, mood or uh, somewhere where you can go with your mind painting is not totally an intellectual act and in fact in many respects I'm a little suspicious of, um, of work which is totally intellectual. Just the space can give you ideas, just the, uh, just the, the space that you get in your own head in the studio becomes inspiration alone. I mean just when you're up at when I'm up at the house and the phone's ringing and everything's happening, you can't concentrate and focus. But the space itself and the environment I have here, which is so peaceful, I've got just the grey box forests out here, the, the, the big skies, there's nothing to really distract me from just nature itself. It's a special place, really, yeah. The studio has a sense of a continuum, which carries with it a lot of my own imagery the continuum of my own imagery. Uh, I know it sounds a bit weird, but I feel as though I, I'm in a continuum when I come into this, this particular studio right now, because a lot of the ideas that I've got hanging in the future, as it were, are very much related to being in this space with little reference pictures and drawings and notes around the place and so on. Um, I, I work every day um, and uh, because I live where I work um, I find that I'm always in touch with with what I'm doing. I think one of the values of, of living with it is that when things occur to me I can immediately um, do something about it and I'd like always to have unfinished works around and if possible more than one because um, you know, if I draw a blank with, with a work, I can perhaps switch my attention to another one. Since moving to this studio, which is not where I live, I find that I need to work for very long periods of time. I used to have a studio at home upstairs, and I could um, start quite late, work for a few hours, go down, put some washing on, go back up again, do a bit more painting. In other words, I could have it mixed in more with my own life, you know, the rest of my life. But here, it's not very far from where I live, it's 25 minutes walk, but it's still a little distance. So I try to arrive by about 9.30, it varies, and work till six or seven at night. Yeah, I certainly don't work nine to five, and I don't go to the studio and, and, and just set up and work through because I can't, I can't, because I work in such a way that I do get very t physically tired because I, you know, really throw it all around, throw myself around and forget to breathe, forget where I am and all that sort of stuff, <laughs> you know, forget, see that's why I don't care about this, I mean this is a, such a derelict studio, <laughs> but it, it never really matters where I am because it doesn't mean any, it doesn't mean anything about, you know, the work, it's totally relevant to the work because while I'm actually working, I could be, I don't know, even know where I am. I work uh, every day, every night. Um, it's definitely the, um, the glue that holds my life um, together. 
and um, it's uh, it's great. It's it's fantastic when you find the glue. I don't go against that. I go with it, and it suits my purposes because, um, yeah, I, I I figure that um, there's not a l lot of time in a life, and there's a lot to get out. So it's um, yeah, definitely every day and every night. Quite hard to get me away, actually. I tend to start work at uh, about nine in the morning. I feel comfortable with that. Turn the radio on and start work. Probably try to eat lightly uh, um, and finish at four. By four I'm spent. There's not much more to be done. Um, and as I get older, of course, fatigue sets in. And so it becomes a bit of a fruitless exercise. So to manage one's time and the amount of energy that one has, I think is absolutely important. But it doesn't get easier. I mean, the, 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 the thing about painting, of course, is it's that old, well, it's a cliche to a degree, isn't it? Uh, that the more you know, the less you know, in a, in a funny sort of way. That's very true. It doesn't get easier. I find that painting actually needs, um, well, if you give it seven days a week, it usually needs nine. If, if you give it um, uh, 10 hours a day, it usually needs 12. Uh, it needs a lot longer than what you, that's, one of the best things about painting is that the more involved you get with it, the, the, the longer it takes, the longer it needs. Um, it's curious, and it's again one of the many paradoxes with painting, uh, that when you begin you don't tend to need so much time, though you have nothing. Um, but as you have more uh, material, as you get more involved with the painting, uh, you need longer. I'm a very disciplined worker. I, in fact, do work every day. Um, I'm fortunate to have a number of studios, so whether I'm working in the big studio in Redfern or the studio in the house or the studio here beside Chinaman's Beach or like a lot of artists ending up uh, drawing on the dining room table. Yes, I'm a disciplined worker. I start, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock. I work till 1 o'clock. I take an hour off. Sometimes I sleep then for about 10 minutes and then I work again, you know, late in the afternoon and sometimes at night. I don't think there are any shortcuts. If you want to be a painter, you have to work. I often mostly work alternate days. I leave the studio the second day because I'm exhausted and the fumes become too much. So, I, and I also like the painting to, uh, uh, to leave the painting for a day. So I alternate the days. I tend to work in bursts, yeah, when the uh, when I get involved in a painting, I'll, I'll work very long hours and think of it overnight and be raring to go in the morning. And um, then I'm likely to drop it for a few days and go off doing other things. I, I tend to be very cautious now about um, working on pictures late at night, especially with drink, because what happens is that, I mean, you go to bed a genius and you wake up an absolute moron and you have to spend three days trying to clean up the poetic mess that you thought was wonderful. Uh, I'll be in the studio by 10 o'clock and then I'll finish 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. That's about my limit these days. Um, and that 12 hours is solid. I might have a brief uh, lunch break, but I'm in the studio and I'll just move from one work to another or I'll concentrate on one work. Basically, that's when I'm working. Absolutely, it's, there's a very, very strict routine. I don't have any routine whatsoever. In fact, I don't like there to be any single rule that I have to play. In fact, I'll try and have the, have the painting not knowing what's going to happen. For instance, um, if I've got a board that I'm thinking of that's going to be rectangle, I'll deliberately turn it up vertically so that there's no preconceived idea. One thing I learned a long, long time ago is what's in your head is fine, but that's just a key that opens the door. What happens on that board is always a surprise if it's going to be good. So there's no routine at all. I, I probably have a leaning towards um, f you know, formality and, and, and structure, but I keep reminding myself that I'm an artist and uh, it should be more bohemian um, than that. If I've had a bit of a break from some work and I'm going to get back to some work, the first thing I'll do is clean the studio. I'll sweep it up and I'll scrape down my palette and I'll reorganise things and it's part of this sort of psyching up process of getting back into the work mode. Well, I paint any time and uh, it doesn't matter if I, I can come home from a trip 
pick up my brushes and just go painting. But I don't plan it because if I planned it, then I'd spend time trying to work out a composition. So I just melt into it. So whatever, whatever I've, I leave it to the bloke up top. I'm a great believer and I believe, you know, inspiration comes from God. Well, it must do because I don't plan anything. There's nothing. You, you won't see any drawings around here of where I've planned a painting and then I'm putting it down on canvas. I make sure that every day I do something. You know, if, if, even if I've got a big thing on, I will come back and somehow address something to do with my work, yes. I do quite a lot of sitting around as well. I tend to sit around in the studio and think about things and look at things, or I stick things on top of other things. I, I'm quite interested in the sort of discoveries you might make if you juxtapose things. So there's a lot of sitting around just playing. Probably more sitting around and playing than there is actually sort of earnest Protestant painting. But there are times uh, during my more intense periods of working when things begin to emerge uh, from the painting that uh, preoccupy me and need my constant attention when um, I don't want any distractions. So in those cases I drink my coffee standing very quickly and I sometimes get into a cab and come to work because I find that even the waiting around at the station or staring out of the window could distract me from the work. Uh, well, I wake up with high anxiety, <laughs> enormous fear, and uh, have to take it on again. And uh, every day seems like, it never seems like the day before. It seems like there's another few more balls to get into the air and to keep them in the air. But uh, mostly I don't rush to the studio at dawn. I, I have a cup of coffee and have breakfast and wander around the block and buy a newspaper and then by 11 I'm normally, 10.30, 11 I'm normally in the studio, sometimes 4.30 but mostly I get into the studio and I don't get going, I wander around the studio like a tiger eyeballing things and hunting about for colours and uh, uh, eventually I, once I strike a blow, once I put a piece of colour on I decide ah, there's a, some access into the painting, uh, it's all it's all go from then on. It's, it's the light, it's the form, it's the character of everything around me. Uh, I, love the, uh, I love looking into faces and bodies interest me, comparative anatomy, the anatomy of trees and plants and colour, the atmosphere, the way it changes. Uh, it's that's the kind of thing all the time that fascinates me and the only way for me to explore that, understand it, to understand my world so to speak, is to get out and start working, painting, drawing it. And that way I'm, it's more like I'm trying to um, uh, to explore and understand rather than complete a picture. I'm influenced by, by um, probably, well literature, nature, the garden. Uh, I like other people's art. I know some artists that never look at anyone else's art, but, but I like looking at art. Uh, but I think the thing that influences me most is probably music. About six or seven years ago, I had this sort of a, an epiphanal-like moment. I was walking down Chapel Street um, after one of those sort of more darker days in the studio where I thought, what do I paint? There's nothing in this, you know, there's nothing around me that sort of is, is exciting me visually. And I, I went for a walk down Chapel Street and I started, started seeing these people passing by, just ordinary people. Um, and I suddenly realised how fantastic they looked and I thought all I need to do is to get this into my studio and paint this and that it's all here in my own backyard. And that was quite a, um, a sort of a breakthrough moment for me because I realised that um, it's so much about how you paint something rather than what you paint and what I'm saying by that is that you can paint something quite ordinary quite banal and make a great picture about it you know I'm thinking of like Van Gogh's pair of boots or um, you know a Rembrandt portrait which is just a guy in a black coat with a white ruff and a face and there's nothing more to it than that but it's the most riveting painting and um, I, I've been exercising that more and more in my own work that um, I, I, I just meet people on the street literally and um, one thing leads to another and um, they eventually come to my studio and I just paint them and 
what I like about these people is that they are just what they are. They don't um, change their persona for me or fit into another mould or take on a role. They, they just are what they are and that's, that's what the painting is. Around here, at a certain time of the year, they burn off. They're, they're all pyromaniacs in Queensland. They light fires at the drop of a hat. And the air is filled with this beautiful bluey grey haze. And the smell is lovely too. But that bluey grey haze turns everything into a, a straight Piero landscape. And it goes on for a couple of months. So it's a very beautiful time to, to see it actually. But that set the code of, of the way I see the mountains out there. I very rarely paint green mountains or any other colour mountain. It's always the bluey haze and so on. When the cyclone was there, it knocked a lot of trees on the road. And that gives me an idea. So when I come back, start to work, I'll put that on a canvas. And yeah, and about what happened after the cyclone. Yeah. The trees lying down. Yeah, all over the, tr all over the road. And a um, lot of big washaways. Which is, um, that's another idea for me to paint. And I have to say my work is very heavily informed by my background as an animal rights campaign which I've been doing for years and so that in terms of I guess the underlying um, subject matter um, that informs it. I'm not interested in particular about making works which deal with the politics of, of those issues but certainly I'm you know that what I do reflects um, a, a passionate interest in human-animal relationships. So I'm really influenced at the moment by a part of the landscape that Australia has that's called Wallum and um, that landscape is, um, oh, it's really in grave danger because it's, it's just beyond the coastal dunes of all round the coast of Australia and it's um, been built on. So there's very little of it left and, um, and uh, at the moment I'm really uh, struggling with painting these paintings that are of a particularly beautiful um, part of Australia which I find um, difficult in so far they are so beautiful so I'm really trying to sort of get past that and get into what it actually feels like. Uh, Gabriela Garcia Marquez, uh, he inspired a series of works that I did in Darwin. Um, other books, uh, Landscape and Memory, the uh, Sharma book, you know, that, that, can, that had a, an effect and I did a series of works in 1999 that were all based on memory because I'd always used that word in my titles for works. Uh, so inspiration can come from many different areas, many different ways. If I'm working on a painting, when I leave here and I walk outside, I'm looking at the world through what I've just been doing. So I might see the colour of some van going past or I might see someone standing in a doorway or seeing something around me which I think, yes, that's what that painting needs. And you, you're, looking every, you're looking at everything because you're partly in the, still in the world of the painting and partly in the real world. And you need to do that. Visits to Japan have been very um, instructive, I suppose, in just observing how that culture in particular um, interprets nature in, a, in the most absolutely, utterly refined way. I've had a funny um, talk with my sister about where we got our inspiration from because um, my sister is a, um, an artist who, who works very differently to me, although I think there's, we've got a lot of similarities. And she's very much inspired by um, my father's architect design house that we lived at when we were young, um, which was very lean lines and very uh, modern. Um, but I think I'm a little bit inspired by my um, mum's mother's house, which we went to and um, our mum's mum we called Little Granny and she was um, agoraphobic and small and um, she never went out of her house, but she collected and never threw anything out. So when she actually died, we went through the whole house and she had 1900 Ono bottles and paintings everywhere and photographs and just, just so much stuff. And it was always dark and musty and had an ancient feeling to me. And that's, I think in my imagination, the paintings are kind of set in a combination of Little Granny's house and an abandoned sort of theatre set. I love the blank canvas. Uh, I love putting putting the first marks on it. I love starting to do things to the big blank canvas. It's when I get to the uh, 
the sort of uh, the middle stages of the painting that I get in total confusion. But I love beginning, yes, I like uh, the beginning. I'll reach a point where I just have to, I just have to put paint on canvas to make something happen. And uh, um, I'll go, the blank canvases, I'm, I'm always quick to start, I've got too many damn ideas at times, but I'll get to a point where something's, a composition's nearly finished and I have to make, uh, I have to make a, a decision and, and I have to just get up and paint the whole damn thing out, e even just to make that next step. And to, to start, I always, um I have a f silence, I don't have anything, I don't have any music or anything and I come into the studio and I get all my like books books out or I, I get all my things out that I and I just spread them all over the floor. So I have um, advertisements or magazine pictures or, or photos I've taken and I just have it all out. So it's a bit like looking into my subconscious which is a bit scary. So there's just stuff everywhere and then I'll sort of pick out ones and then I'll I'll move into it through there. Well, normally I I, um, I go through a process of painting a picture. I'll I'll start off with with scribbles in a sketchbook. I have these large bound books that I I call studio books that I have all my little notes in and sketches and scribbles and whatnot. Even I even write out descriptions of pictures. Um, it'll then go to a bigger drawing or a, or a, you know pen and ink work. Um, a watercolour, uh, and then perhaps an etching, uh, and then a, a um, half size uh, study, uh, uh, and then the finished painting. So there's always something on the go all the time. And if I'm sort of stuck for something to do, I'll do a self portrait or, or you know, do, a, do a, a plan air picture or you know, stretch a canvas or do something. Well, the main thing is to get rid of the, of, of the white. Uh, uh, my my teacher John John Passmore um, said to me, looking at um, one of my student canvases, and he said that whilst there was white, there was hope. The way I get started is I come in, I get a perfectly good piece of white paper, and I totally ruin it. When, I, when I'm starting a painting, I always um, always prepare it with colour. Just throw colour onto it, just without any care or thought at all. Even it doesn't really matter what colour it is, but I just score it up and scratch around and throw acrylic paints around and and just just break that white. And then and then it's just a matter of using paint. You know, just make just getting just the physical act of using paint, putting it down on the palette and then putting it around and then using the drawing because I go out into the landscape and draw and translate them to ink and uh, and then bring the ink drawings to the studio and work from them. The best thing to do is drink and they start to loosen up. I mean I don't find a blank canvas too much of a problem but a blank sheet of paper I find absolutely terrifying and I'm capable of writing reasonably good prose. I mean I wouldn't say any more about it than that, it'd be undignified. However to be confronted with that page I find that very very difficult in the sense that you will start one sentence and I will labour it to the point where there's no sentence there almost, you know. But a canvas, no, I usually, when, if I'm confronted with a canvas, I usually know what I'm going to try and do with it. Um, and I'm not bad at that. Now the result's another question, of course. I, mean, um, I tend to sometimes feel like I've got a new idea coming on and, um, and it's often been percolating around my head for quite some time and usually that's not attached to an actual visual that I have. Um, so what I sit down is, do is I sit down I've got a sheet of white paper and I draw what we call a thumbnail sketch when we teach, sort of just, it's like a sort of an outline. And I find things start to emerge on that and so that's my initial kind of sketch. Um, but because I'm reliant on um, what I see, I can't draw anything very realistically out of my head. People look like mushrooms when I just draw them straight out of my head. Um, then I either make props or I, I use models and I clothe my models and do different things and then so then from then I do a drawing and then I also do colour studies and then from the colour study quite often then I'll go to the painting. So I very rarely approach a um, blank canvas um, and just start madly painting on it. That's just not how I do things. So. Well, normally I uh, 
calculate the, the shape and the size, which is actually pre-calculated because I've ordered the stretcher. I think, right, I want a six by six, or I want a square and a half, or I want a certain vertical proportion or horizontal proportion. And uh, the shape dictates the approach. And mostly it's a mathematical equation that I begin with to hang the uh, armature, to hang the structure on, the scaffolding on. And in other words, I relate to the space beforehand. Once I've decided on a shape, then it tends to dictate how I divide that space mathematically. A painting can take from anything from an hour to five hours solid, or it can I can work on the same picture for mm, a year, but it doesn't all, I don't often do that. I usually work fairly quickly. I don't have any recipes for how I paint. The, you can go into a paint shop and see all these beautiful expensive paint brushes and I don't buy them anymore because I know that I don't need them. I actually use my hands. I have no recipe. I don't know what's going to happen and the relationship between me and the boards. My husband does my boards for me. I usually design the size I want the boards. I know I can do anything on the board, I can hack it in, I can scrape it, I can use a chisel, unlike a canvas where you've got to be a little bit delicate. There is no recipe. It's like, um, I suppose it's like a, a love affair or, or a conversation. There, you don't know where it's going to go. I will sew with a machine. I will, I will start to uh, hand sew. I will um, start painting over that in acrylic and then I might assemble it in a collage way. But when I'm painting on a canvas, I really am quite a traditional painter. I will start with just drawing. Uh, the, uh, the drawing out can be drawn in pencil or in uh, charcoal. I'll actually fix that drawing sometimes. At other times, I will start just very spontaneously without any idea and just let the paint itself speak to me. So there's many processes I go through. It depends on the mood I'm in. I do, I do what I call my splosh. And then I have been keeping it uh, very, um, very, very aleatoric, random, by moving with these big sheets of paper through, through these burnt trees. And so this has been quite a, quite a discipline. Then after that, I move in details from where I am. And so that actually has, uh, I think, uh, with these, uh, there, there is a definite sense of moving from the, the wilder and the more gestural down to the more, the more spe specific. So th that, that's, there's hope for me yet. If it's a painting like the one just behind me here, which is a single figure, I'll just work straight on the canvas. Um, I'll, get, um, I'll decide who I want to paint in my model and they, they turn up and I basically sort of spend five minutes of saying, oh look, you know, just you know, try standing there, the light's good. And I just go straight onto the canvas and um, I start with a very sort of thin washy paint and I, I draw directly onto the canvas. I don't do any kind of charcoal or line drawing initially. Um, the whole thing is actually quite vague and amorphous for, for, for the first hour or so of painting as I'm moving forms and shapes and lumps of tone around. Um, with a bigger picture that might involve, you know, more figures and, and, and more um, compositional forethought, I tend to do drawings and studies. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm currently about to uh, attack a very large canvas in the next few weeks and for the last month I've been doing nothing but drawings of single figures and studies and, and, and bringing together all the things that are going on in my mind but the, how I think this image is going to work and, and doing it in the drawings and then they will then be tools to transfer it onto the larger canvas. The image painting starts obviously on the computer in terms of working out the composition. I, I still use rather quaint old things like golden means and things and I put those on the computer, on the image. Um, and I work the image up in that way until I get something in remotely, or fairly, not remotely, fairly accurately like I would like it. I then 
square it up on a big canvas. Um, the process is, is this, it's always been this. I ink the drawing in on the big canvas. I then work with burnt umber, scraping and scratching and wiping and so on, and get the whole underpainting of the picture in one go on the canvas. And I, when they're thoroughly dry, I uh, get to work with glazes and scumbles, scumbling thin colour, wiping it with my hand often, you know, just putting on so I can get the right degree of transparency and so on. That's just getting, well, that's this one here. It just started at that stage. Then you get the finer brushes and detail and you start building up the detail and so on. I generally work uh, flat down and, and so the painting is horizontal because I use liquid uh, water paints, acrylics, um, as a base. So it has to be uh, flat down so that I can control the flow of, of paint. And I, I generally start off with a, um, a bucket of uh, the colour that I'm using, uh, like uh, yellow ochre or, say, ferric oxide, and mix with glue, natural pigments, which I um, gather from my travels. You know, I've got a bucket full of uh, Pilbara sand there, you know, <laughs> which is a, a beautiful Indian red colour, and I mix it with some uh, PVA glue or Boncrete, and then that, that forms a nice sort of quick drying surface that I can uh, then do the details on. Um, I use encaustic um, and heat it up and then pour it on. That takes about a month to harden or dry. I usually get at it long before I should. Um, and that allows me to dig holes. I work down rather than build up. Those holes or the lines are there to hold eventually the pigment. And um, they're very, it's labor intensive, not so much the hole making itself, but until I get to the point where it has a reason to live. And um, all the experiments and all the mistakes are all on the board, so the history of the work is imbricated within the whole thing. And then once I sort of get going, I'll draw it up, but I always like to find where the centre of the canvas is. Canvas, hardboard, whatever it is, doesn't matter what you paint on. But I always like to find the centre. Don't ask me why, but I've done this for so long, I don't know why. I almost re always want to know where the centre is and mark it, measure it. I set it up so I have a chordal language of zones, horizontal, vertical, well, horizontally laid in a vertical rhythm. And then uh, I let that dry, I don't rush in, and then I begin to think of ascension and dissension and uh, looking through or uh, the, the tactile quality. Uh, at that point, I don't go blank, but somehow uh, my intuition comes forward and my uh, uh, sense of history and artists, other artists that interest me, other paintings that interest me, uh, come and go as the activity happens, but dominantly I, I'm not standing there thinking this is what I'm doing next. It, once I'm in the swim of the painting, the painting starts dictating to me uh, how it might unravel and often you come back the next day or the, the second day uh, and it, it's not what you thought or it's not where you thought it would be and you go in again. I start with the model. Um, models, I am very fussy about models and they've got to have personality, they've got to be able to look you straight in the eye, they've got to be able to accept what they're doing and um, I'm just not interested in glamour and all of that sort of stuff, that's not interesting at all. You have to have a girl who's capable of, through me, 
communicating with somebody else who's a viewer and that's not easy. The act of painting of something is not important. To me the subject matter is very important. Because basically what the painting, what I'm doing in the painting is something quite selfish, just, just for me in a sense. I'm trying to nail my feeling about something before it's lost forever. But in the end I think the subject is the most interesting thing, the idea is the most interesting thing. Even though sometimes the idea might be the very picturesque nature of something. And sometimes to find something as cliched as a hot day at the beach. I mean, I think I might have done a picture when I was five in kindergarten and called it a hot day at the beach. Well, I'm still doing pictures called a hot day at the beach. So the idea is still there, but I'm trying to find a much more sophisticated way of doing them. I think the subject's important. I always paint something that I feel is important, yeah. Mm. Well, technique's very important too, but then again, there is times when I've painted a picture just to exhibit a technique. But um, doesn't sound fair, Deacon. But it usually works out all right, you know, because I'm trying to trying to expose this new technique, and I'll use any subject to do it, and that that and that changes as you're painting on it. It'll develop into something else. It doesn't matter. It still works out all right. I never have any flops. I'm lucky. I think the process of painting is more important than the subject matter. Um, one of the things I used to really struggle with as a figurative painter was, you know, what do I paint? And I, particularly when I came out of art school, I, I um, felt this tremendous pressure that everything I painted had to mean something and um, had to, you know, that the narrative or the symbology in the picture had to be sort of, you know, portentous and meaningful and, 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 and basically that's not me. I mean, I'm the kind of painter who would rather just um, I, I mean, I, I can just sort of paint the way the light is hitting a thigh and the, the volume of that thigh. I, I find that the riveting thing about painting. But in the end, in the end, the subject matter doesn't matter that much. You know, the, the more, you realise that um, uh, if you just rely on subject matter alone, you can make a sort of a interesting subject matter, but you might be doing shit house paintings, you know. And the thing is, in, in the end, what it is, the subject matter becomes less important to the actual way that you you you, you make a picture, you know, and and, um, and but but the subject matter has a role, and it's always a sort of it's like the thing you hang something on, and and and, and you uh, uh, people can relate to it as well, but it's but it's not so important. It's not that important. Oh, the process of painting is much more important than the subject matter. I mean, of course, you know, you, you do want to have some kind of conceptual idea. I mean, you, I mean the process is, is intellectual in itself, but you, are, you do want to be able to kind of talk about it in an intellectual way, verbalise it. I find it's really important for me. The, uh, the process is linked to the blood flow, the energy, and the energy that it takes to make a painting becomes the subject of the painting. I don't think when I'm painting. Um, I'm much more interested when I'm painting not in a, any matters of weight or consequence or moment, but rather it's just too dark or too light or fairly mechanical um, kind of questions that are, um, I suppose they'd be considered very, very um, lightweight questions. No, I, I never think about anything other than the immediacy of the medium. Subject matter is very important to me. Some people it doesn't, they don't care that much. They want to use something just as a starting point. It doesn't matter whether you can tell what it is or where it came from or what. It's just about formal things with paint. I do care what it's, what it's a, a picture of. It is a picture. And I don't mind if people don't know exactly what's going on in the painting. I don't care if people misread it a bit, as long as they're in the general vicinity. For example, if it's a painting that's supposed to be, I don't know, a, a sad, lonely sort of painting, and they think it's all about people laughing and singing and having a good time, well, then I'd feel like I've failed. So I don't mind if they don't know exactly the theme of it, but as long as they've got the general feel, 
there is a feeling that if something is too entertaining or too interesting or too engaging, it might be dumb or banal. And the more boring it is, and the more difficult it is to like, the more intellectual it is. There's a quote by Somerset Maugham, which I can't remember the exact wording of, and of course it's about writing, but it applies to painting. And um, to paraphrase it, it says, if something is entertaining or interesting or intriguing or engaging in some way, it can be considered trivial. But if you can bore them in the right way, your reputation is assured. I love oil paint as my preferred medium. Well, I'm, I'm really hooked on oil paint at the moment. I love, um, love using oil paint. I, um, I love the smell of it. I love the feel of it. There's no question that I'd find the medium of oil painting um, uh, far more satisfying than, um, than working with acrylics. There's, there's no comparison for me. I like the meanness of, of acrylic, the way it just dies in the bum, you know. It, it always looks appalling acrylic and I, that's what I love about it. It's just basically pigment and then you put it on and that's it, you know. I love oil but it's probably killing me. As a kid I disliked oil paint. I used to make my own paint and I used to have this awful temptation with the um, white lead. It smells so nice, it's like baked bread and I always was frightened that I would eat it in the end. I like oil. I don't like acrylic because it's inert and it doesn't leave the mark you left, you leave on the, it doesn't reveal the tactility of oil. And I like oil's unreliability. <laughs> <laughs> Acrylic's a good medium, but it gets a bit on the nose after a while, you know. I smell like a diesel engine half the time when I'm using acrylics. Ooh, I guess, well, you, you get a little bit of the water where you wash your brushes and put it under the microscope and it looks like St Paddy's Day races. And that's overnight. I really do adore pencil, charcoal and watercolour above the other mediums. Although I like, I love oil paint. There might be three or four months I'll be working with acrylic and then suddenly I think, oh, bugger that, I hate the feeling of that, and then I'll move on to oil. Acrylic has this sort of dumb naivety to it and you can just work at it so simple and then there's a water-based thing and there's no fumes and there's no drying time as well, so you can be quite spontaneous with it. I uh, had ready access to beeswax through my eldest brother who's uh, an apiarist, so it became a natural way of extending paint, particularly in my early years when you know money was short and you really had to make one tube of paint go a long way and beeswax is fantastic. I seem to get spontaneity from the difference of medium so I haven't really got a favourite and I've got to keep hopping from one from one lily pad to the other. Well sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll do a painting and then you'll think oh that'll make a good etching and, and the, perhaps the etching will be the main thing you keep, you destroy the painting. Or you'll do a drawing and it'll be the best thing of all the things you do, the painting, the etching, the whatever. I tend to explore other mediums with my characters. Um, I do a lot of work with embroidery. I do a lot of work with laser, with um, plywood and um, cutouts. And it's really nice for me to say how these characters can be reinvented, where they can play. The whole process of going into the film is almost the chattering in your mind as you're, as you're in the easel. You start to bra you, you, all, you, you brainstorm and you um, conceptualise your characters and where they can move. A sketch, a small two-dimensional sketch could trigger a massive three-dimensional object and vice versa. Uh, and a lot of what I play with is, is very much about those exchanges. I move from one material to another material uh, or, or form from painting to sculpture uh, to prints and so on. And I, I try other strange materials, I, uh, uh, making flags and um, I make books. Uh, I don't know how artists today uh, work without having a, a knowledge of drawing. I just think it's the basis for everything. You just, it's where everything begins. 
Um, a lot of drawing I do outside in the landscape. I draw, I've got endless sketch, sketchbooks and diaries. Uh, I have to draw all the time. And it's through the drawing that the ideas come forward and that, you know, and I think you can, I think you can really tell an artist who's had some drawing ability and you can certainly tell the ones who haven't, you know. Drawing really initially is the bones, isn't it, of, um, of a painting. Drawing in a sense is, is, is like a, um, an archive of the thinking rather than drawing to make art per se, yeah. It's much more about noting things down, yeah. You would be surprised, I've got enough drawings from a model, if you could pulp them and turn them into bricks, you could build a two bedroom home out of them. <laughs> So they go nowhere, they're just things in themselves. So yeah, I do a fair bit of preliminary drawing. I, I wouldn't just start a canvas not knowing what was going to happen. Although maybe I should. Uh, I, I feel such a, 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 you know, a joy with paint that I really, um, I just go straight to the, the finished painting with hardly a sketch. I'm scrubbing out a lot more paintings than I did now ten years ago and going back to the drawing and starting again. I, I'm much, much better, I think, at editing than I was at the start, but I guess that's a, just a process that everybody goes through. Uh, there's nothing that you can't do in drawing that you can do in painting. Painting, for me, was an exploration of atmosphere and colour. Uh, uh, it just added a, another dimension to drawing. Look, I think it's so important that an artist who can't draw has a limited future. It's as vital as that. The spontaneous leads to the unexpected, which is what one's always hoping for. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty spontaneous painter, I think. And it, if the painting is boring me or not interested in me, then I'll try and eliminate that element as much as I possibly can and then I'll have it hanging around the studio and then I think that's the revision part where I'll just keep on just looking at it and if it, if it clicks after a while then, um, then that's good. Uh, Twenty years ago I, I, I was a spontaneous artist and I used to, used to paint three or four plein air pictures in the morning. They were quite small and they were very brushy expressionist thing but you know expressionist art is is, is for young people <laughs> and I, I, I changed. Without the thinking process coming into it and the analytical process, uh, the hand tends to have a, a wisdom that the mind can't quite penetrate, if you know what I mean. If you work spontaneously, you'll often find that you've, you've put down things that you, you weren't conscious of. So spontaneity, um, it's something that um, um, I admire, I think it's fantastic, but I want to take it further. I can't see spontaneity as a, as a, as a daily practice being even, ach even achievable, and perhaps that's you know, one of the sort of the limits. So I like little outbursts and sort of mark making, and there's a process where I'm very spontaneous with the building up, but it's interesting because then I end up painting over most of, of that. The actual drawing of that face might have taken two minutes but I have done it over and 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 then I've had to put it aside and abandon it and then I've had to bring it back a week later and do it over and over. So it, it usually, so it's interesting that quite often the, what looks like the quickest and most, most spontaneous bit is actually the most difficult bit because it has to be so right. So it's a combination of both. There's the spontaneity is there to begin with but then it is, um, later controlled by, I suppose, a, an aesthetic sense. Oh, destroy works, yeah. <laughs> um, which my husband can't stand, because I come in there and I'll go, I can't stand that painting, I'm just, I feel like I just need to get a knife and just slash it. I have slashed a couple of paintings but they're not like I control myself now but uh, so now now what I do is actually just paint over the canvas 
So you'll probably, you know, you used to come, they'll probably be x-rayed and there's probably three images underneath them. So I do paint over the works, yeah, definitely, yeah. I rework pictures sometimes, you know, 10, 12 year old pictures, work over the top of them, change them, alter them around, which, which I enjoy doing. And I probably destroy, say out of, it, out of a year's work, at least, at least a third of it would probably be destroyed. But that was just like uh, a decision I made that, you know, now that I'm getting older, you're in the hands of the curators if you die, and they come into your studio and everything's there. And you'll get some weird curator with some weird bent who'll put up a show that is his idea of what your art's about. And I thought, fuck that. You know, I just thought, no one's getting their hands on these, these hokey things. And, and, and so I destroyed them. I destroy a lot of works. I've had several uh, bonfires. We had a, we were living in some mountains on the Victorian um, um, New South Wales border, and we had the most spectacular bonfire one night where I burnt my life's work with a, a not. There was no sense of elation or of depression or anything. It was just nice to see the sparks going up. I tend to think that artists all have too much work. Things get sort of destroyed. Sometimes you paint over something. You think you can sort of do it better, you scrape it off, you paint over something, except that you only realise you only clogged the whole damn thing up and it gets worse, you know, it gets worse and worse. You think you can rescue it sometimes. In the end, in desperation, you put your foot through it, you know. <laughs> I find that you, I have to destroy them because the canvas becomes cloyed. And not only does the canvas become cloyed, but one's memory of the damn canvas becomes cloyed and you, you see it as a sort of an insult. <laughs> I don't often rework a picture and try and, you know, I think if it, if it, a picture should work, you know, with a certain uh, fluidity. Over a few times, I mean, you know, you come back to them and come back to them, but, you, you know, once you know that you're sort of, you know, it's like when you fall over, when you're physically falling over, you know you're going to go. There's nothing you can do about it, and you just go. You're just going to have to say, well, here I go, you know. So then you know you, you've lost it. You, the, the picture's gone. I destroy quite a lot much to some people's chagrin and I work over things, things come back from shows and I look at them and think, oh, I can go further with that or I can, oh, I really want to change that and uh, so, you know, I get back to work on them. Yeah, I just love destroying things. I mean, that's how I really started painting, by destroying something and trying to save it and then again, yeah, so, I, and I love the random marks that are underneath peeping through and they're totally uh, unrelated to what's going on top but they still give it some endeavour and they give it some interest and yeah, I, yes I love, I love working over my paintings. And uh, the other day I was in Melbourne painting a portrait at a big institution and there was one of my earlier portraits there and I was in this room all by myself uh, working out my composition, the sitter hadn't arrived. There was one of my paintings there that I'd done about 15 years earlier and um, I'd looked at it of course and then I, I um, you know, during the breaks and things I'd stop and look at it and I thought, hmm, that background is just too green. So uh, one day I just got out my paints, I rubbed off the, uh, the um, varnish with terps and I repainted the background. And nobody at the institution knows, would have noticed the difference, but uh, I'm very happy that uh, I had that opportunity. <laughs> no, I think I've always worked in series. I followed something through to the, as far as I can push it. So that becomes a complete series and it's sort of a complete oeuvre within that series. And, uh, but simultaneous to that, I'll be working on another series, pushing that to, so it's not just one thing at a time. I've always painted in a series, although probably less so now than I used to. Um, I often now paint paintings from a series that was started or finished six years ago, and I'll paint another painting of that, of that moment. People, when they start to paint, or if they're not used to the idea of you know how artists work up and think why are there so many things of this thing isn't it be boring to churn these things out and I mean if it is boring to churn them out you shouldn't you should stop but 
it does work naturally. It does. You do. You try this thing. It didn't quite work, or you think, hey, maybe I should do it this way, or maybe I should try it in these colours, or maybe I should distort it in this way, or do something else to it. And they do grow out of each other. And then there's a point, which again you can't predict, where it feels as though you've done it all and you have to stop. I have painted in series in the past, and those little ones were often in series based on classical myths and so on. But these late ones, I think, are one-offs. Uh, occasionally, a motive will recur. For instance, uh, that Bochran's painting of the Island of the Dead uh, struck some sort of chord in me, and uh, it appeared in altered forms in, I think, two or three of my paintings. I'm working on a series of works um, called Nature Speaks, which are 16 panels. Um, and I started them, when I started them, I didn't think of it as a series, but it's e evolved into a series now where I'm trying to do 100. I've done about 85, 86 of them. And I find that the series actually format it has a, you know, quite a lot of power um, because it allows you to, you know, not every work has to be a masterpiece or equally attention grabbing. You know, there's room for, you know, quieter works or even kind of fairly, um, yeah, kind of works that don't speak very much but are interesting within a, a larger body of work. And sometimes the series is short, sometimes I have an idea that I really need to paint and like my series of game birds that I did and they um, portraits of game birds I saw them at the show and I really needed to do more uh, port yeah, paintings of them and I maybe made 40 studies of birds and felt that was enough and now I'm on to my cactus so sometimes I'll work on one set of paintings for a year or two and sometimes it'll be a couple of months. I actually thought I would try and Paint a, so paint a um, series of just people walking their dogs and how many ways I could possibly do that motif in every possible way I could possibly, um, not, not to reinvent a style, but try and work that motif as hard as I could. Um, horses was my first because I was horse obsessed, passionate little girl. So I did that when I went through art school. I just did horses. Um, then I... Um, was over the horses when I finished art school and I didn't know what to do. I had a very small studio so I did still life, I did cups and saucers um, and after that I painted a shell show. Then I had a, a food show um, where I painted, I guess I bought the plates back and put the food on the plates in my landscape show and the cock show and now the cactus. I am working a lot on commissions now and funny, contrary to how people view commissions, they think that it freezes up the artist. But because I'm working from a highly designed perspective in the first place, for me it's like a new set of problems are given, such as a new type of space, such as a new climate, such as a new um, surface area. When I say surface area, I mean textual surface area. Those unexpected things that come from a particular commission force you to think in a different way. I've been asked many times if I would do a commission for a portrait and I've always said no. I never take on commissions. I never paint a commission for a landscape either because I want to just have my own freedom. It's the only thing that I have which is which is mine. This isn't a business, it's, um, it's, it is my life uh, that exists outside of other people and therefore I can't relate to what they want, what their needs are. If they pass by a painting and they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. But I won't do anything for anyone else. I love commissions. Uh, mainly because they break me of my tendency to overwork and keep working on things and never finish. Uh, with a commission, um, because of the buyer's imperative, you've got to finish and often in a relatively short time. 
So I love that discipline. I hate commissions. I can't do them. I can't do a portrait commission. I've been. I've got about three portrait commissions that are ten years um, <laughs> behind time. People are still waiting for them. I can only do things when I want to do them. I mean, I can do a portrait if I'm, you know, feel like it after a few bottles of wine, and sometimes they work. But um, no, I can't do them. I do quite like commissions because they change me, they change my space, they change my ideas and things. Um, it's a bit hard because they've got a, an idea about it, but I do a lot of pa I do a lead up painting to it. I'd have to if I was doing uh, a, a self portrait in front of their Monaro, then I'd have to paint Monaros for a while. I'd have to get in the Monaro mode, but it would be a challenge, and and I would enjoy that just as a spur. Portraiture. Yes, I take commissions because I sometimes end up going where I don't want to go and to me it's a discipline and it's a structure and it's something that I'm trying to learn and I figure that if I only do ones that I really want to do I'm not going out of my comfort zone. There's always a fatal mistake with a commission that you try and put too much in to sort of, you don't, I suppose in the back of your mind you're trying to sort of get the essence of a place and so often as I said you, you sort of you don't murder your darlings enough because you're trying to think, oh, well, I've got to include this and that. And so it's, you can really, sometimes you can tell pictures that are commissions. They have a sort of, they can have a kind of um, self-consciousness that other pictures don't necessarily have. So I, I don't, I'm not desperate to do them, let's put it that way, but they have sometimes got me into situations that I otherwise wouldn't have done. When the Rugby World Cup was out here, um, I did some designs for the Rugby World Cup. And I did, it was a charitable exercise, but then I did uh, the poster for the World Cup, which obviously had World Cup, uh, and it had a picture of Sydney. I mean, that's what it needed to say. Here is the World Cup, and here is Sydney, as a painterly form. It's a big poster. Well, I sold the original for that for about 40,000 bucks. And there were a lot of very wealthy English people out at this time. And an Englishman, when he found out the original had been sold, asked me whether I would do another one. And I said, well, I can't do another one, you know, exactly the same, but I'll do it in a different proportion and a different size. And I, 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 I'll do it. And he agreed to pay me pretty much the same amount of money, in fact, agreed to pay me more money on the condition that I put something on the painting that he really wanted. And I wasn't so sure about that because I don't want to be told what to do. And I said, well, what do you want on this painting? He said, I want the score underneath. England 22, Australia 17, England world champions. I said, of course I'll do that for you. <laughs> It's only like the Sistine Chapel. The guy said, you know, you want to you know, write a little bit on the bottom? Exactly. <laughs> when I, I, I first saw the masterpieces overseas, when I first went overseas, I realised how many mistakes were in these pictures. I thought it was terrific. I thought it was great. I mean, you know, there to be a huge sort of David picture and the knee would be wonky in one of the things. You think, well, he left it, you know? So there's always something to learn from something you've done that's not particularly right. So no, I don't really believe in mistakes. I, I think uh, um, the only way forward is by making mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes, I suppose, in painting, but they're not mistakes, and as I have in life, it, because they're, they're an example of what you did then and uh, you learn from it, I hope. You try to avoid mistakes obviously but when they happen and they do I assure you even to the best painters then it should be a case of joy because something's going to come out of it. Mistakes are like some a bolt of lightning out of the blue I mean they're sort of fantastic sometimes so in terms of developing work. Very rarely I do a few workshops and 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 honestly 90% of that workshop time is getting people to make mistakes. to get Because what happens is people get so worried about getting it right, the paintings become not trite, but they become very similar to what was before. 
and, and because they don't want to make mistakes, they want it to be the best thing. And we all do that. It's, it's, that's our nature to want to do that great painting. But, but hey, I say, why don't you completely stuff that? And then, and then maybe you'll have to find a different solution because if you just go on getting it right instantly all the way through, it will be the same painting again. I would say there's no such thing as a mistake, no. Yeah, the mistakes are probably God's answers. <laughs> In works, a mistake is an important thing. It's the marred thing that you have to have, like the, the say the Japanese ma something, the pot or whatever they make, because there has to be that way for the spirit to come in and out. I like that idea. A mistake for me is something that's wrong. And I think in art, there's nothing that's wrong in a sense. I think it's, I think anything that happens, there has to be some dimension of, of, of judgment. Otherwise, well, you know, why are you here? But if something's not working, I wouldn't call it a mistake. I'd say it a way to find something that is working for you or a step in the right direction. And even if you have a really, um, you know, uh, a show where you look back on the work and think, God, didn't really do it for me. I mean, inevitably that is going to lead you to the stuff that, that is working for you. Oh yeah, God. Sometimes mistakes can be good, but there's, you know, you know, I can think of any number of paintings out there that it's, it's hard to go back and look at because you go, oh God, what was I thinking? You know, that was, you look at things and you go, that, that was really, Either, you know, just an element of it where you think that was a really unresolved, not very good bit of painting there. Or a whole work where you think, no, maybe that one shouldn't have seen the light of day, but you've got to live with those mistakes. I think, I mean, we're all human, I, you know, I, I find me an artist somewhere that's never made a mistake. Maybe someone just better recognising them earlier than I am. My um, carbon painting things that I'm doing at the moment, which involve um, relating to, to the actual burnt stuff of things, all came from a great big mistake. I was doing a really boring, very serious drawing of an area of burnt tree, and I was doing it with wonderful care, and it, it had, had a nice quality, but it was... i I'd been doing it for two days, and then the wind blew this biggest piece of paper onto the tree I was drawing. So I couldn't draw the tree anymore because it was demolished. But when I picked up the drawing, it had these um, fascinating marks on it. And so that was a, uh, and that led me to, to do a whole lot of drawings that use that, uh, reuse mistakes. So now uh, quite a lot of my paintings are uh, three quarters huge mistake. I think the biggest mistake as an artist is letting your work go out of the studio too quickly. There you go. I think it's repeated time and time again, and I'm guilty of it all the time. And uh, uh, in fact, the other day I had a painting up at the uh, museum, uh, up at uh, New England Regional Art Museum, in a show, and I saw it and I went, oh. And I couldn't wait to get it back, and I reworked it. I'll show it to you later, and it's a much better painting. The biggest mistake I've ever made is trying to paint pictures which I think are going to impress an audience and they've invariably been the, the worst pictures I've ever painted. Um, yeah, the biggest mistake you can make is to ignore your own instincts and to um, force yourself into a painting situation that's not you. The mistakes can be fantastic. Like one of my paintings, mm, I was... Um, I'd finished it and then I suddenly looked at it and went, oh, the, some white, it's little white speckles, little spots had come all over the black area. And then I thought, that is perfect. It's exactly, I couldn't have thought of that. That is exactly what it should have been. So, like, um, what was the question? As a matter of fact, sometimes, a mistake would be what holds the painting together, would be the surprising element in the work that uh, moves the painting forward and shows you, um, throws you on a route that you haven't been on before. Um, and that could be um, full of um, possibilities and it's exciting. Um, so uh, I wouldn't like to see a painting without mistakes. 
Well, I think paintings are made of completely of mistakes. <laughs> They're all, it's all a mistake. <laughs> Owing to its uh, organic fluidity, that it's unpredictable and not very reliable. That's why one keeps doing it. <laughs>Oh yes, yes, yes. A lot, lot of time actually I'll, I'll sit in front of my canvas, even some already half painted, I still can't do anything. I've s just spent the whole day just sitting there, sitting there, but nothing come up. So I just listen to the music and then watch my painting and just stare at my, my canvas for a whole day and do nothing. I don't consider it necessary to paint every day and if I don't paint for sometimes a month it never worries me because um, I'll, I'll be thinking or reading or walking or doing other things or having a love affair or that kind of thing so I've never suffered from artist block you know, it wouldn't worry me if I never painted again I don't think because that means that I'd be doing something more interesting. <laughs> Uh, I do get painter's block. Uh, I get painter's block, um, not, look, not a lot, but there are, after, usually if you're painting an exhibition and it's taken you two years to paint an exhibition, the painter's block usually comes after the exhibition. So you have the bit of a, de you have the down, downer after, because you've got this climax to the show, and then you have this anti-climax, and then you think, oh, that was all a bit sort of, so what? I think. Artist block often happens because you're jaded and you've, you've been too busy, you've done too many shows, uh, there's too much demand on you, you, you start painting for a market and I think it's time to leave it alone for a bit. I, don't, I think you've got to know when it's time to travel and look at other people's work. I think there's a time to uh, become very insular and concentrate on your own work and I don't go to shows when that is happening for me. Like now, I'm just two weeks away from uh, a show, and I, I'm not really interested in seeing anybody else's work. But after this, I'll spend a month reading. Reading, a lot of my ideas come from literature and not necessarily looking at art magazines. It's uh, um, novels, you know, biographies, and something a lot. You just have to give yourself time. I call it impasse, and of course, Every, every painting except for two paintings, uh, I've had block at some point. Like, of course, you get excited and you go too far with an area and you have to pull back. And of course, uh, it's, and the, but the more, the harder I work and the more often I work, the less I get painter's block. And, but if I start to get to, 
self-satisfied with my work, painted block comes in. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you can, to get painter's block, rid of painter's block, you just go out and have a party, you know, go and we have these really good nights in town with friends who, Iggy plays guitar and I've got a friend who plays cello and other friends who sing, so we have these good nights where you go out and stay up sometimes till three or four in the morning trying to just, that's good for painter's block because you sort of, come through the other end feeling, you know, sometimes a bit shattered, but you sort of, it seems to clear away the cobwebs, that sort of thing. I get painter's block and I just don't know what to do. Um, and I go to the post office and walk around the streets and clean brushes and sweep the floor and make a nuisance of myself until I finally have to do something and um, you know st stop being self-indulgent. I'm a great procrastinator so I can put off put off but when I'm in you know if I start I know I'll be okay I'll just I just have to start but sometimes that block of because it's uh, yeah it's demanding to keep uh, the tent, you know, the uh, excitement going, the, uh, it's demanding, yes. Some, sometimes, to be perfectly honest, you actually um, you just get a bit tired of being in the studio. I mean, I had an episode of this recently and um, I just thought, oh, I think I need to be out of the studio for a little while and perhaps do something in the garden or just, you know, get in the car and go for a long drive or, look you know because the studio is right in the middle of the city now so just look at sky or you know be in a position where you can do that yes i've had painter's block um uh, numerous occasions uh, i came back from uh, a residency down in hill end and um, i'd worked for quite a a long time down there and uh, worked uh, using watercolours and my whole idea was that I'd translate that information back into paintings back in the studio. Well I came back and had a crack at it and um, somehow I wasn't close enough to the whole place to allow that to happen so I went back again and uh, I spent some more time down there uh, thinking that I would uh, I'd be able to get past that problem that I was having. Uh, I was really um, uh, transfixed by the place. I found it really quite wondrous. The whole idea of gold uh, it was quite magical to me because my whole family um, had a history in the process of, of gold mining in Australia. So I was very um, committed to that. Um, but again, coming back, I spent another uh, 12 months working on paintings and um, I've probably got 40 paintings put aside that I've just put aside. So um, they're aside and I'll come back to them at some stage. I won't let them go, I'll go back to it again, but at the moment that's not happening. So I've moved on. Uh, well, there was a period of time when I knew, no when I knew nothing else but painter's block. Um, and, uh, and I think that's not necessary, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think um, painting is not a linear process. You don't begin here and know all your stages and end up there. I mean, what would be the point of that? There'd be no experience in it. Um, so uh, they go through very, um, uh, they go into very dark alleys, they go into very unclear territory. Um, and, and again, uh, just to mention that risk of failure being there, um, it's, it's important that the work goes through that um, to arrive uh, at what it is at the end, uh, not to experience things with it. I mean, sometimes you can come up with a painting that looks good, it looks like a painting, but, but you would scrape it off if you've not yet experienced enough with it. Um, so painter's blocks, um, well, are inevitable. Um, and the way you go through them is, um, well, you just go through them and come to the studio every day. I've, I've um, never suffered from 
any kind of painter's block, which I think may be to do with the fact that I am, uh, I follow my bliss and that I've got lots of funny ways of doing things. Um, so that I've always got about five things. It's a bit like I used to milk cows for a living for a short time and I, the, the cows would be all 30 cows are waiting out there in the, in the paddock to be milked. No, it wasn't this kind of milking, it was, was actually um, machine milking. And my idea is a bit like those cows. I've no, I, at this moment I've got about 10 cows out there and my problem is, is not um, that the cows have all died and I've got painter's block, but that which cow am I going to milk? It's, it's, <laughs> it must be, it, it, I'm, I'm quite lucky like that. I think part of the block business for for someone of my generation anyway, is, is to do with that life experience and also art experience. I think that, that the more, in a way, the more you know as an artist, the more you've seen, um, the harder I find, the harder, it's, the harder it gets to actually feel that you can um, tack what you're doing on to that huge um, and endless depth of human knowledge. I don't think there is a thing for me as a painter's block. I think it's just a matter of, I suppose it's a bit like surfing, not that I'm a surfer, but using the metaphor of a surfboard. You can see surfers on a surfboard just waiting for a wave. And they just wait, and they can wait and wait and wait, but you've got to be there to take it. Interestingly enough, this studio, has inspired me because of what I am living in. I'm living in a rural area and it's been the most incredible feeling of wanting to paint where I am. But that might dry up tomorrow and tomorrow I might wake up and think there's nothing to paint. You can't get too upset about it but when, it, when you haven't got anything to paint about it's not that you think it, I don't think it's that I've got a writer's block so much as just hang in there, stay on the surfboard, something will happen. I, I do suffer from artist block, um, especially when I'm moving into a new area. New, I mean, I, I suffered from an artist block when I first moved to this space. And, you know, you, you always feel like, you, you always feel like a child trying to walk again every time you do work for a show and then it's all gone, I mean. My, my work just goes out of my hand as soon as I do it and I don't see it again. I, I s s go through months where I, I, I just really struggle to find uh, any meaning in, in, in the, anything that I do. Um, and it's such a fine line between one painting that is just bad and meaningless and, and another where it transcends itself and, and, and it's inherently meaningful and that's the sort of cusp that we you know that you have to ride out well I, I think um, what, what happens sometimes is that um, you know a particular line of um, development um, you know I start to get bored with it and um, you know it starts to seem too repetitive so you know I'm, I'm always looking for you know, at the back of my mind, I'm always thinking of where I'm going to go to next. Um, but it might take um, quite a long time before I kind of implement any of those ideas. Like it might take three or four or years or longer. Um, one, one thing I do is I, I now keep like um, these A4 sheets of ideas. And um, I've already um, done about 2,000 pages. and. Uh, <laughs> So if I'm ever um, stuck, I'll just go and have a look at them. Yes, I, I, can, I get the artist block, but I have ways of getting out of it. I have ways of working myself through. Uh, just music can lift me out of it. Uh, it's usually literature. It's time, and, and it's, it's weeks and weeks of working on maybe drawings instead of working on paintings. That can get me out of those blocks. Just going back to drawing, going back to painting in the landscape 
going back to just collaging. I used to tell my students, you know, play, get a lot, a lot of rubbish, get some old magazines, uh, sit on the floor, and I often do that. I sit on the floor and rip out everything that I find interesting and then start collaging it, just putting it together to make a, a new idea. Because I don't think you can will it. No. You, can, you can will involvement, but you can't will a, a, a cheerful result. You can't, you can't will. I don't think you can will it. I mean, um, earn, earnestness can be often paralyzing. Intent can be paralyzing. I'm sure there are explanations. I mean, if we, if we were wired up with electrodes to see which bit of the brain is uh, most active on those good days. And, and I think that you would find that the bad days, those parts of the brain are just not active. Uh, and I think it's all to do with the temporal lobe, uh, uh, so I understand from limited uh, knowledge. I just don't believe that any good art is, um, is not self-critical. I don't believe that any good art is, is not intelligent, for instance. Um, I think that the, the process of making art is very, 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 very difficult. And unless you bring that life experience to it, then there's nothing there. As far as having a time of not painting, which could be called painter's block, I suppose, the only time that I have is when I'm a little like a chained elephant. Um, when a show is complete, the paintings have filled my studio and I'm waiting to start again. That is, as soon as the paintings go, I'm off to the bush again and looking for new subject matter. So I never sit around waiting for something to happen. I always go out and look for something. Yeah, well, I mean, I suffer from cliché. Um, and of course I suffer from artist block. I mean, um, but whether you're talking about is that a good thing or a bad thing? You see, I think sometimes that, uh, and I think, I believe that sort of fatigue is a drug. And quite often what's referred to as artist block or it could be businessman's block. I mean, what it is, it's, a, it's an inability to think creatively with pleasure. And so you run out of it, you run out of steam. Mostly it's got to do with fatigue. I mean, as Harry Truman said, go on fishing. Sometimes the best thing you can do is that, in my opinion, leave it. Leave it. I mean, if the mind is a muscle, leave that part of it alone. Go and play. I mean, even as a child, I, I had this sense that, uh, you know, you've got to earn your stripes. If you want to be able to paint a great picture or write a symphony or, you know, write a half decent novel, um, there's, you know, a long and arduous course that you have to get through a lot of hurdles you have to jump over to earn the right to be able to make that piece of art and I've always thought that and um, that might be a result of growing up in an artistic household in the 70s where I saw lots of artists doing what they did and um, saw a lot of artists being very relaxed and drinking more bottles of red wine than they were actually spending time in the studio and there was this sort of sense of like just let it sort of all hang out and let it happen and um, I've always sort of um, reviled against that a bit. Even, you know, as I said, even as a child, I used to think that that's just lazy, that's slack. You know, that this art's a serious business, and it requires you know serious work, and uh, and and that, that of course has affected the way I approach my painting now. When I left school and decided I wanted to be a painter, so to speak, uh, I did look at the art schools back in the early '60s, and. Um, I assumed that somehow I'd find a place there, and uh, but already at the age of 17, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted, it wasn't exactly, but I wanted to paint life around me, nature. I wanted to study it. I wanted to represent it in black and white or in paint. And uh, I was profoundly disappointed. The art schools were doing nothing that interested me. Uh, with a few exceptions. I did join a life class because I'd never even painted from the nude before. But uh, 
I soon realised by the time I was 17 or 18 that the way to go was to study myself. I, I knew that by staying home one night, I was working during the day, I could learn more than the art school could teach me in years uh, by looking at books, by studying anatomy, by studying light, physics of light it fascinated me, uh, studying form, perspective, I, I'd spend hours uh, working through all those um, aspects of uh, representative, representational uh, art, which to me wasn't even art, it was more about studying nature, studying my visual world. And uh, that's what has stood me in good stead ever since. And I, I, I continue that process now. And. Uh, when kids come to me and ask about uh, art school and stuff, I, I try to get them to take control of their own education rather than go to the schools. I, I remember going to my first piano lesson and I was basically confronted with these endless sheets of scales, arpeggios, technical studies, etudes. And um, I said to my teacher, I said, oh, don't we get to play any real music? And he said, you just concentrate on this first. And literally for a whole year, we just had to do um, technical work studies, um, uh, there was orchestration and, and, and then quite a severe discipline applied to the whole thing. As opposed to my first day at art school, which happened some seven or eight years later, where I was basically put into a little box-like space and told to make art <laughs> with um, virtually no instruction or tuition whatsoever or guidelines. It was such a stark contrast, but um, I've always been very grateful that I did the music course first and that helped, that informed the way that I was going to approach my painting. What I'm really dealing with is, is actually painting that journey um, from a realisation of dispossession right back to basically the garden. I'm reinvestigating, you know, my role in the ethnosphere, which is basically what um, country I was told about in oral history and getting back there. But while I'm doing it, I'm trying to paint the people, the places and the feelings as it's happening. When people say, well, look, you're, you know, some of your work is very popular, I always take it as a compliment. I'm going to say, well, thank you very much. And if some people would say, but, you know, isn't it a bit decorative? Well, yes, it certainly is. And some of it sets out to be that. Um, it used to worry me more in the past, I guess. It doesn't worry me so much now. But the concept that somehow that art is only good if it's impossible to understand or if it's somehow uh, the prerogative of a very narrow group to involve themselves in that uh, always strikes me as being slightly strange in the sense that if you love art, and I do believe in the time in which we live, when television is so powerful that the role of art, I, I think, or certainly for me, is about beauty, is about the joy of living, is about the great love of colour and especially, you know, the great luck, I think, of living in this particular country. You can't compete, or I don't think that you can compete with the terror that you see in instant photography of what's happening in various parts of the world. And so I think sometimes artists are disappointed when they find that their art that they put out to shock isn't in fact shocking. And I, I would think that one of the most avant-garde things that you could be doing at the moment is trying to make beautiful things. I guess the other way of, of um, looking at it is that some of the imagery that I use, if you didn't find a way to paint it any other way other than literally, it, it would be too obvious, like some of the imagery in the painting behind me would be considered pornographic. If it was painted literally and classically, it, it would be just like pornography from a magazine, but because I treat it in such a way, and it's very obfuscated by the, the treatment, um, you have to seek out the imagery and it's just not as obvious. I think especially as you go, go further into your career, sometimes the pressures of having to come up with, you know, a brilliant idea, <laughs> it doesn't always work. And um, I think that's actually a really great danger for artists, probably once they hit their mid-career, 
is that um, there are these, you know, pressures, as it were, and uh, to, you know, produce major work and, um, you know, deep, insightful comments and so on. And and sometimes I find the most, you know, insightful thing you could probably do would be to make a small, beautiful drawing. You know, most of my paintings take three months to make but I don't work on one at a time. I, I start some and then move about a bit, but uh, eventually the paintings take three months to finish and there's roughly 17 layers on each. But recently I've been playing around with uh, glazing and uh, I, I continually try to surprise myself and the, you know, the nature of paint, it's such a tricky business painting is that uh, 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 I try to do things that paint doesn't want to do. But when it's finished, it goes into the house, onto the wall, and then I, I live with it. And, and, you know, if there's something bugging you, eventually you'll see it. And another technique I use, I look at books and books and books of, on art. I just never stop looking at them. And then I just glance up. And sometimes when I'm just looking up, I'll just see what is it that's really annoying me. Because sometimes you can look at something and you just can't get it. You can't see why it's not doing what it should do or why it's unbalanced or why it's niggling at you. But it, it, it's like glancing and glancing back and sometimes it's just, you go, ah, right, yeah.